Joining me now is CNBC senior markets correspondent Dominic Chu, NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba outside the White House, where the president will be speaking shortly, and Wall Street Journal economics reporter Nick Timorous. So, Dominic, first to you, what does this takeover of First Republic mean? How are the markets reacting today? Is it, does this end the crisis, or is it just, just another step in a spreading crisis? Andrew, those are all good questions, uh, and I'll start with it by saying, to, to, to try to answer all of them, that this deal for J.P. Morgan Chase to, to acquire, to buy First Republic, came after the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation held an auction where some other larger regional banks reportedly participated in it as well to see if they would want to buy those First Republic assets. Now, J.P. Morgan will get all of those deposits at First Republic and substantially all the assets at the bank as well. Now, to put that in numbers terms, that's roughly $92 billion in deposits. Uh, and that includes, by the way, the $30 billion that it and other banks put into First Republic, you may recall, last month as a sign of faith in the bank. It will also take on around $173 billion in loans outstanding that First Republic has put out there and $30 billion in the securities portfolio. Now, in order to get this deal done, J.P. Morgan and those federal regulators at the FDIC both agreed to share in any potential future losses on any of those First Republic loans I just mentioned. We're talking things like mortgages, also commercial real estate. So what this does mean is that anyone who is a customer who has deposits at First Republic will be able to continue using the bank just like they always have. And because it will eventually become part of J.P. Morgan Chase, once all the integration is done, all those customer deposits will be held at J.P. Morgan Chase, which is viewed as one of the, if not strongest, American bank. Now, the FDIC does, Andrea, estimate that this will cost the deposit insurance fund roughly $13 billion versus the cost for Silicon Valley Bank's collapse, which is estimated at $20 billion. But this is a huge deal nonetheless. And, and you may recall, Andrea, that back during the great financial crisis, the biggest bank failure was Washington Mutual. And it was none other than J.P. Morgan Chase that came in to rescue that particular bank. So this is very much a big deal. And so, Nick, is this a good deal for J.P. Morgan Chase? Uh, bottom line, is there a lot of risk involved for them? Or are they just being good yeah, citizens? I mean, no, thanks for having me, Andrea. I mean, Jamie Dimon on a call this morning uh, said it would be a good deal for the bank. It was a competitive situation. Um, I think the story here really, though, is that when you look at First Republic, what happened was we had an earthquake when Silicon Valley Bank failed in mid-March. And earthquakes can destabilize other buildings. They can weaken other buildings around the epicenter of that quake. And that's what happened here to First Republic Bank. They lost $100 billion in deposits. That was a cheap source of funding for the bank. They were able to replace that money with more expensive loans from the Federal Reserve. But when they reported earnings last week and they made clear the extent of just how much money had gone out the door after the failure of SVB, people began to say, wait a minute, is this bank really viable? Is there a franchise here that makes sense? And you just saw the stock tank uh, as the week wore on last week, Andrea. And Dom, um, before we, I don't want to lose you, but I want to ask you how the markets are reacting. <laughs> So the markets specifically, when it comes to First Republic, I mean, we should point out that there is intrinsically no value left in this stock. You might see quotes for it come out there. But generally speaking, the markets did expect this. This didn't come out of left field. And to Nick's point, we've been seeing a steady, I mean, precipitous in the beginning, a precipitous slide in the value of First Republic's equity, its stock. And then all of a sudden, it's just been going down and down and down in a straight line ever since. This has been antici anticipated. What's curious right now is what it does to this sentiment around the markets overall. Other regional banks have been caught up in that earthquake that Nick mentioned for these particular moves tied to Silicon Valley Bank. But unlike First Republic, many of these regional banks that have reported earnings over the last couple of weeks have have actually shown that their deposits have stabilized. And in certain cases, for certain embattled West Coast lenders that are considered peers of First Republic or Silicon Valley Bank, like Pacific West, like Western Alliance, they've actually said in the last few weeks they've seen customer inflows for deposits. So that'll be a dynamic to watch, Andrea. And Monica, one of the things that 
the specialists whom I've spoken to are you know, concerned about is that the markets are not yet reacting to the possibility of default, the debt ceiling crisis not getting resolved. And whereas you know, Washington usually resolves this thing at the very last minute, are there any signs yet <laughs> between Speaker McCarthy and the President of the United States that this president, the President is going to negotiate now? that the speaker thinks he's got some leverage because of having squeaked through that budget plus, well, budget debt ceiling combo last week uh, with, you know, 27 to 2015, the narrowest vote. Yeah, that is the absolute critical backdrop to all of this and this important conversation that you're having here, Andrea. The fact that we are nearing uh, what would be these extraordinary measures that would kick in, that the Treasury Department, the White House, following so closely. This is a president and an administration that has said definitively, we will not negotiate when it comes to the debt ceiling, but we're really seeing that being tested now as Speaker McCarthy has gone out and said that he would like to sit down and talk about not just that, but the budget. And so this is now a White House that essentially is going to have to confront that, though they have been, in terms of being consistent with their strategy, saying, we don't know that we're going to invite Speaker McCarthy anytime soon to sit down, because again, we don't feel there's any room for negotiation with something that could be this catastrophic for the financial system if indeed the U.S. were to default for the first time ever in history. That's never happened before. So I think you can expect the president to continue to reiterate that message when he's in in the Rose Garden here shortly for National Small Business Week. He's going to continue to hit Republicans and echo that message from the White House last week, specifically on that bill that you mentioned, saying that if that were to become reality at some point, it would be small businesses like the ones he's going to highlight today that could potentially suffer. So he's going to see, take all of this, bring it together, Andrea, essentially in what you could call this Rose Garden campaign strategy that we've seen since he announced his reelection last week and likely will see Republicans repeatedly for months to come. And likely, I think there's going to be some more pressure because Congress is home this week. They're going to hear from their constituents. They're going to hear from their small businesses and their bankers. And people are generally getting the word from back home. They want talks to take place, some negotiations. Dominic Chu, Monica Alba, Nick Timoros, it's great to see you all. Thank you so very much.